Hello, friends, and welcome to Bible study. Uh, we are in uh, Philippians. So we're in the Niv, Philippians. We're doing um, chapter 1, verse 27, uh, into chapter 2, uh, verse 18, which is seven, several parables. Uh, this is, uh, as a reminder, this was written in about 61-ish A.D. Uh, it's a letter from the Apostle Paul to a, a very poor church in a Roman city called Philippia, which is actually in Macedonia, modern day uh, Macedonia. Uh, it was a city. Um, I wouldn't necessarily know that they would describe it as a metropolitan city, but it was a pretty big city. And because um, metropolitan, uh, to me, implies a certain level of like dedicated to technical advancement kind of city. And that's not necessarily the size the city was, but the church was poor there. So it wasn't a very big church, but Paul really, really lo like loves these people. Um, chapter one, verse 27, whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manny worthy of the gospel of Christ. Yeah. I call that act right. Uh, then whether I come to you or see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. So act right whether I can see you or not. Act right for the sake of acting right. Now, as a reminder, at this point in history with these people, there is no Bible. The Bible hasn't been written yet. The council of Acts deciding that, you know, you didn't have to become Jewish to become a Christian. That Christianity was not a sect of Judaism, which some people in the early church absolutely felt that it was. And it was definitely something that the Pharisees and the Sadducees are trying to have happen because politically speaking, that makes it their problem and they can deal with this blasphemy and it doesn't make it a Roman citizen problem. And Paul is arrested right now and in Rome because they were scheming in order to, uh, to kill him in the first place. So this is already playing out. So he's very much so. This is not a sect of Judaism. Firstly, it is consistent with Isaiah that it is not meant to be a sect of Judaism. So verse 28. Without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you, this is a sign to them that they and that by God that you will be, oh, I said, that they will be destroyed. Um, let me reread that, because remember, he's got a reason. These are people going to churches, confusing people who want it to be a sect of Judaism. And I'm not saying they all work for the Pharisees. Some of them just very strongly felt that, because Jesus was a Jew. It was the Jewish Messiah. If you want to share in salvation, you got to become a Jew. If you're not Jew, it, you know, because you're not genetically uh, Jewish, so you have to convert to the religion. That's just their saints. Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come to you or I see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that by God, for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now here I still have. He said, you're getting to see the scheming that I told you existed play out in front of you as I'm now showing up at your doorstep with their scheming. Stand firm. Stand firm because the devil is always going to look for a foothold. And that God will use whatever energy is in the room and so will the devil. Which one gets it? That's on you. Chapter 2, uh, verse 1. Your little hair. Imitating Christ's humility. If 
you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Don't ever consider yourself full of uh, ego and superior to everybody around you. Paul was very, very focused on unity. Uh, verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourself. So humility, very big focus for Paul. Paul had a huge focus on unity in what was being preached. I mean, and he, I mean, he obviously got his work because if you take a look at the Catholic Church, you're, you still see that influence there. You get the exact same reading, the exact same everything at any Catholic Church you walk into anywhere in the world on that same day. That is absolutely so. He, you know, it does happen. Do not do anything out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider your uh, consider others better than yourself. He's talking about being a servant leader. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also the interests of others. It needs to be good for the collective group, not just good for the individual. Uh, your attitude should be this, the same as that of Christ Jesus. Jesus was a servant leader. And that is one of the ways that you're supposed to be able to tell when someone is a Christian in verb. Because you're supposed to be a Christian in verb, not just a Christian in noun. Don't just spout his name. Like It's beautiful that you have a lot of uh, faith. But Paul's saying, act right. If you act right, you don't have to tell anybody what your faith is. You don't even have to talk about it. People who are in the same faith as you will be able to tell that your core values and theirs are, are the same. So it doesn't matter how you get there as long as you're interacting with everybody around you respectfully. That's my particular opinion. But you can see that it's, it's something here that Paul at least is laying the groundwork for. Like, what are you doing? You know what the gospel is. We're supposed to act like Jesus, not like ever, act like everybody else. He's the example that we're supposed to, that's why they have that, what would Jesus do, right? I mean, that exists as a, as a catchy thing for now. But you remember, servant leaders. Now, servant leaders is not necessarily an easy thing. When I got my MBA, I went to a Christian college. The entire focus was on servant leadership. So, you know, it was like a deep dive because the MBA is really, a, it, besides how to create the, the proper documentation for the job you have, the rest of it is really about how to be a leader, how to manage people, how to communicate with others, what needs to be communicated, where you're dancing along those legal lines of what you shouldn't be saying, that kind of thing. But, you know, for me, I, uh, I very much feel like it brought a certain amount of maturity, but also spiritual maturity, because it was a Christian college. So, verse 6. Who, being in, in very nature, you know, God, there's a footnote here, or in the form of God, or being in the very form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Of course. Then. But um, for, especially as a part, like what? Equality to God. God the Father? Like... The living God? I can't produce life all by myself. So, you know. And, and I don't know anybody who can. Like, I can muck about with plants, but that's not really me producing life all by myself, is it? Because I'm mucking about with plants. Right? So. Hmm. Uh, no, thank you. Uh, but he made himself nothing. Right, Jesus didn't say, I am equal to God. 
That's right. Like that's very true. Uh, taking in the very nature or the form of a servant. Yes, he was a servant leader. Being made in human likeness. Mm -hmm. And uh, being founded in an appearance as a man. Uh -huh. He humbled himself. Very, yes, so. Because rabbis, Pharisees, etc., etc. If he were playing their game at that level, the Pharisee, Sadducee level kind of thing, he wouldn't have hung out with any of those people. Their rules said those people weren't allowed to hang out with those people. That's part of what made him controversial. He was hanging out with the people who were considered on the lower portions of the societal hierarchy. So he was serving the people in need. And that was not what the Pharisees were doing anymore. That's not what it was about. And the Pharisees were the ones who were popular and out there. Because to be amongst them and for them to decide that they like you brings you raising. So clout chasing in today's uh, language. He humbled himself and became obedient to death. Even death on the cross. Like look at what he gave up. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place. And gave him the name that is above every name. See, Paul has lived his life as a Pharisee, so he knows exactly every little bit of ego boost that Jesus gave up. Because it was, it was monetary riches. It was everything big that we consider like status symbol in this world for their time. Jesus gave all that up because he could have lived his life with them. And that's not where his focus was. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that is Christ. And that, and that at that name, Jesus, and the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Because he gave his last life up to the very last breath of everything he is. He took on every sin, past, present, and future of the world for every human that could ever exist. So Satan would never be able to claim it at all ever again. So he gave up everything because that's a lot of contamination to the soul to take on all at that last moment, which is why the father, why have you forsaken me? Because he had to descend, which is what Paul says. He had to go down to, well, Sheol, or for us what we would call hell. And then God raised him back up afterwards, forgave him when other beings who are sent down to Sheol don't get forgiven and don't get raised up. Normally, if you get down there, you don't get to go back up. In the heaven and on the earth and under the earth. That's what Paul's talking about. And the, every tongue confess that Jesus is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. Because only God could have risen him from Sheol. All right? uh, shining as stars. Verse 12, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work on your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Do everything without complaining, or arguing, so communicate with each other so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in any crook and depraved generation in which you shine like the stars in the universe as you hold out, make a D, or hold on to the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. If you guys hold firm and continue to be the example 
that we are supposed to be uh, servant leaders, then even if they kill me in this Roman prison where I am being held, it will not be for nothing. Please don't ruin my life's work by believing that you have to become a Jew to worship Christ. All right, so... I mean, because Jesus even made that clear, because there was, uh, I mean, there's a red flag, red flag on anybody telling you that if you're not part of my particular religious group, you can't go to heaven. God decides who goes to heaven. No one but God decides who goes to heaven. So they don't have the power, nor do they have the right. No one has ever had that right. Only God decides. And he'll decide for that person on the end of their days. You don't know what their relationship with God is. You're not, it's not supposed to matter. Because you're supposed to treat everybody like they're your equal. And you're supposed to want to serve. We're supposed to be following, conducting ourselves in a way that would make Jesus proud. And he said, love one another. He said, basically, people are messy, and you're supposed to love them anyway. They don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be perfect. He's not asking for perfect. He's asking for our heart. And that's a problem for a lot of us because the world has made us where we feel like that's a really big risk. Um, mostly, it's only a really big risk if you are very, very, in my opinion, for other people are going to have other opinions but in my experience in my opinion only if you want to be really really caught up in what other people other living people think of you as a person if you're going to spend your time with your eyes on their race you're going to get bitter in your heart your eyes aren't supposed to be on their race your eyes are on your race you're trying to be a better version of you than you were yesterday some days that's going to be real easy because you had a hard day and maybe you said a lot of mean words to people and now you need to go apologize because that's what grown-ups do. So you go do that. So you can feel right in your heart and you show him that, you know, no, I know, I know. Let me go fix it. Go clean up my mess. I know. And on other days, it's going to be real hard because maybe you had a fantastic day and you did amazing things for somebody else and today you just don't have that energy and that resource. If you get through the day where you were just nice to everybody and that's all you managed to do for the day, you're still ahead because he asked you to be nice to people. Love one another. Compassion is the most basic form of love in existence and it costs you nothing. Just don't be rude. If you can't feel, if you feel like you can't be rude, it's okay to go isolate. Go isolate. Get yourself centered. Get yourself, you know, vent it out, get it out. However you got to work it out for you. Get it out so that you can be nice to people. Because that's really all you're supposed to be trying to do every day. And it's really not that hard. I don't know why people make it so complicated. It seems so simple to me. If what you want really badly require someone else to be hurt in order for you to have it like on purpose malicious hurt not they just have a lot of feelings and are caring about my race when they shouldn't be hurt like they have to be in some sort of actual pain especially if it's physical pain but you know emotional pain mental pain spiritual pain whatever it is like if you have to deny their humanity for you to have what you really want then you need to reconsider what you really want and your motivations for it. Because why do you want anything that requires another person to continually suffer for your pleasure? You have to consider that. Because you know, you've got a much bigger thing to go work on. I beg all of you to be the best version of you to be that you can be today. I know I'm going to certainly try. Happy Monday. <laughs>